name is Sam Towns and I am a aquarist in Austin, Texas. And I wanted to show you my uh, Red Sea Reefer XXL 750 today. So these tanks are made for usually uh, reef tanks and giant reef tanks. They make it so that you can do uh, pretty much, it's like a plug and play or as most as it can be uh, with having plumbing and all of that. But I like to have a challenge. And so I decided to set this up as a freshwater planted tank. Uh, I wanted to be able to show people that this is possible and that although they're geared towards saltwater tanks, you can do it, uh, freshwater plants. And so this is the tank. It's uh, pretty much like a 180 gallon standard tank. So uh, roughly it's six feet by two feet by two feet in length, width, and height. Uh, it, it's actually made in metric units, so it's a little bit off in all of those, but that's pretty much what it is. The glass is three quarters inch thick, so it's super thick, although it's ultra clear glass, so you don't even notice. You can even, um, I, I, whenever I'm on one side of the tank, I can see the, the room through that tank and through everything in the tank, so it's ultra clear glass. Uh, it's really awesome, so the thickness has really doesn't do anything to take away from that. But because of the thickness and the weird metric uh, measurements, the main tank is actually 160 gallons total capacity. And then the sump, which I'll show later, is 40 gallons. So it comes out to 200 total gallons of water volume. So in this tank, I like I said, I did freshwater plants. And so I'm going to run through how I set this up. And then after that, I'll talk about all the hardware and how all of that um, runs. What I started with was I had to decide what I wanted to do for the substrate. So most people will do either simply gravel or they'll do something like EcoComplete or they'll go for one of the pH buffering soils like aqua soil or um, one of those other ones. And because it's such a big tank and I wanted to uh, make sure my plants were healthy in a long period of time, I actually went with a soil. So a lot of people use potting soil. And what I've learned in gardening, because I also garden, is that uh, compost, is, which is pretty much any uh, food scraps broken down um, into a soil, that has all the nutrients that plants need. And so that's what I went with. So there is a thick, pretty thick layer of soil. Um, you can actually see, if you look on the side here, that I have it pretty a pretty deep layer with it being shorter on the front going higher in the back and this helps make the tank look deeper but also having such a large amount of soil makes it so there'll be plenty of nutrients and uh, good soil for the plant's roots over a very long period of time so that's why I uh, did that and at first I thought it was a little too much but I think um, it's kind of grown on me, especially as the plants have grown in. Another good reason to have a really thick or deep substrate layer in a tank like this is the actual tank is about, I believe it's about 24 inches tall, or, you know, roughly. And so whenever you're up in the tank, I mean, right now I could barely reach the substrate with it being several inches off the bottom. And so this helps short people like me get into the bottom of the tank. And so I appreciate that. On top of the substrate, I mostly put sand and it's just a really soft sand. And I did that kind for Corydoras catfish because I love them, but I didn't want their barbels to be cut up by sharp soil. So this one's really soft, but it's also heavy. And so that's perfect. It's kind of like play sand. Um, another thing I did that I wish I hadn't done is I have this plant, uh, this, it's almost like a gravel, but it was a plant uh, substrate sold by Chewy, but I don't recommend it. I can, um, I can talk about it in the description what that is, but I don't recommend it. Maybe in smaller tanks it would be good, but pretty much what's happened is it's come up to the surface, which I usually don't mind. In most of my tanks, I will do a mix of sand and gravel because it looks more natural, but I just don't really like this one. Another problem I've had with it is for whatever reason, it's attracting algae like crazy. So I started with setting up my, uh, I did the rocks, 
And the rocks are a moss agate from a local place here called Nature's Treasures, which is awesome. And then I also have manzanita driftwood from a company called Houston Manzanita. So I was able to get it pretty cheap because the guy's really close. And so I have actually four pieces of manzanita. And what I did is I glued them together using cigarette filters, which is a really neat method. So the, we literally super glued the cigarette filters to get the wood and the rock to stick together. And it held like amazingly well. So when we filled the tank, we had no floating or anything. And so we set that up and it took about two hours to plant all the plants. Most of them are from either Boost Plant or just local Aquarius. I got some at an auction that we have um, quarterly in the fish club. And I got other ones from Boost Plant or on forums or on Facebook groups. And so I planted all of those. We planted all of the wood plants, which are like epiphytes, the Anubias, Busophalandra, all the mosses. And then I planted all of my uh, cryptocorns. I call this area like the Cryptocorn Valley, the middle area here. And I thought that I could put a lot more in it, but bigger tank, a lot more substrate. These heavy root feeders love lots of good soil. And so they grow a lot bigger than in my other tanks. And so I have these main like three ones with the Cryptocorn Spralis Tiger being the center one here. And it's doing awesome. Loves a ton of light. And then after that, we had planted all the background plants. And so when I started this up, I was like, this is going to be a low light, easy kind of tank. But when I started buying plants and thinking of this tank, which I th was setting up as my dream tank that would have everything that I wanted, I got a little excited and I wanted to try all kinds of things. So instead of uh, buying like everything for a low light system, I just was like, why not? It's my dream tank for high tech. And so I got plants like in the background that are more higher tech at least for me, like I have Rotala, Macranda, I have the Limnophila, Aromatica, um, Ludwigia, Natan Super Red, which is back here, and, and just plants like that. I tried Alternathera, uh, Reneki, and a few of the higher light plants I wouldn't normally do. So, but after I set all that up, I still felt like it was empty and I spent a lot of money on plants. And I was like, why is this still empty? And so I went ahead and got Marsilia. Uh, this is Marsilia angustifolia. It's the carpet plant down here, which you can see the, the crayfish likes. This is my crayfish who I need to name. So if you have any name suggestions, let me know. And I planted this Marsilia thinking, well, I've grown this before. It was a really easy carpet plant and looks really cool. It's like a, a clover-like plant, except when it's underwater, it doesn't act like a clover. It just has one leaf on each of its stems. But I planted that and it started growing out and it was spreading really fast. I just got it from a tissue culture and just put it in different areas of the tank. And it, it spread like everywhere. And then it all of a sudden got covered in like a fuzzy like hair algae. And it's driven us, my wife and I who, who works with me on this, it's driven us insane. And so that's why, so this was all completely covered before with Marsilia and it looked really awesome. And when you're looking from like far away, you can't even see the algae other than in the really bad points. But whenever we would bring people over to look at this, you would go up close and be like, oh my gosh, there's like a huge mass of algae in that Marsilia. To the point of it actually had, these sections are empty because it actually had, the algae choked it out. It killed it. That along with, I had so much plant mass growing that the, the light actually was blocked out from the front and the front tends to be the area that gets the least amount of light is the front uh, foreground which is this whole area so so we decided to just pull that pull all this out which is probably a good move because it was less algae there's a ton of gunk built up and the quarries like it so we have different types of quarries uh, that he got these are all they're like a false kind of julie Cory, and then I have Cory Doris Aeneas. I had a guy, a local guy actually give me some babies. And so there's like seven or eight of those in there of different sizes. So we decided to go with that. So other than that, I mean, we haven't had too much problems. Algae has been the biggest battle in here. I haven't had problems growing anything. I mean, everything grows. It's just, are we gonna get algae in it? And so right now, the challenge is, what do we do with the Marsilia? So we decided we'll probably keep some 
of the marsilia like this portion is like not very algae covered but we're almost about to just pull it all out because honestly we like the sand look and the jungle kind of forest and so we'll see so right now the only other issue than that is just getting enough flow to the whole tank so in this tank it's a uh, it has a overflow box which is here and pretty much the water if you've ever had a tank or seen a tank with uh, that's plumbed and has filtration in the bottom in a sump it overflows into here into this uh, these grates on each side and it goes down and i'll show that in a little bit but it goes down into the sump filtration at the bottom but it goes through all our filtration and then it runs through a pump back into the tank which is you can see it has the two outputs but since the tank is so big it even with a really strong pump it's not doing too much for flow for the whole tank and that's one of the possible downsides I would say doing this fresh water is that if you did salt water, you could have tons of flow everywhere in this big tank, lots of power heads. But in this one, if you did that, your plants would be blowing all over the place. And so that's one big challenge. And that's why I've added a lot of like, um, we have a lot of algae eaters in here and sand sifters. And I'm even testing the crayfish out to see, you know, what he's gonna do. They're obviously moving stuff around, cleaning up plants for me, which is kind of fun. So if you're going to do plants in a big tank like this, be super cool. Love them. If you're going to do plant, uh, plants in a big tank like this, I would just recommend you either go kind of light on plants or go low light if you're going to go heavy for less algae or have lots of algae eaters. So we have um, narrate snails, mystery snails, all the corridors, catfish, the Siamese algae eaters, which they go to town on algae is super awesome. There's some in a way. And the flagfish are really cool. Flagfish are really good algae eaters and it's funny to watch them go take a chunk of hair algae and just gulp it down like pasta. And there's a pair of those in here. And they're supposedly mean, but not in my tank. I haven't had any aggression from any of my fish. I also have a pair of epistogrammas uh, in here and no aggression. And I think that's one of the, the benefits of a big tank is there's a lot of room for fish to make different territories. And so they don't fight. There's no reason to fight. And if you feed regularly, they don't fight, which that's the other thing. I have a lot of baby fish, so I feed them a lot. And because of that, I'm gonna get a lot more nutrients built up in the tank to cause algae, so. But that's pretty much the main tank here. Um, other than that, I might eventually go lower light and I'll remove all of the like highlight plants or higher demand plants and just go with mosses and things. But here's what happened. I covered all the wood with moss and anubias, but you can see like all the moss and the boosts of philandra and the anubias is they just get algae all on them because they have the direct light on them, like powerful light right on them. So I'm getting all of that gunk. But what's interesting, the difference in this side and this side here is that because I'm growing this hydrocodal tripartita, it is like pretty much it. We stuck it just into the moss that's on the top here and it just rooted all in it. It was really cool. And it can take the, this ridiculous amount of light up here. These lights are so strong. So I can kind of go into that. These are uh, AI Prime uh, HD freshwaters and I have three of them because they have, they're supposed to have about a 24 inch spread. And I got a par meter whenever I set this up and I tested it and yeah, it was like, they perfectly spread light, plenty of par throughout the whole tank. Like uh, the only places that were somewhat low were all the corners. And I probably could have even adjusted them a little bit to make them better, but they're doing awesome. So these lights have grown everything, but I had, when I started them, I actually had them at 100% power, thinking like, oh, it's a big tank, it's really deep, I'm gonna need a lot of power. But what happened is uh, a lot of my plants that I planted, starting at 100% light, they just melted because they couldn't handle the light and the pH change, all the transplant shock. And so that was dumb. I recommend if you put strong lights or you're gonna get a tank that's gonna eventually be high light to start them low and slowly move them up so your plants can adjust. And so, yeah, I had like Blixa uh, japonica that was right here and that all melted and um, that was disappointing. And I had a bunch of other stuff. I had a bunch of crypts that melted 
and crepes normally melt, but they like completely melted and turned to mush and never came back. So that was a mistake. So I thought it would be worth showing the uh, over the top view of this tank because it's super cool. And I'll start in this section here. One of the things that's really cool about having the open top and lights suspended like this is that not only can your plants grow out of the water, so all this Ludwigia Natan's uh, Super Red here is growing out of the water, which is really neat. But also, I mean, you can come, and I have Ricky as well that's kind of growing out of the water, which is really cool. And I mean, these things, you can see like, these lights are so strong. When I had this at 100% power, it was about a thousand par at the light, which is like insane amount of light. And um, so in this area, obviously it drops the lower you go down. But these plants love a lot of light and there's no algae on them. We got a little bit here and there, but they love it. Just a little bit. So um, this is a really cool um, thing to have with this tank. So open top, no problems. You don't have to remove your lids and um, you can just, let's say you want to feed, you can just come feed. Say you have a plant that's uh, floating a little bit, you can just come and just pull that right out. You don't have to take all your tops off. So growing up, taking care of aquariums my whole life, I would just avoid going to clean a tank because I didn't want to have to take the light off, the lid off, and I don't know how many times I dropped my light and lids into the tank. So you don't have to worry about that here. So this section is really cool because I have the hydrocortal growing here. And although it gets a little bit crazy and it grows really fast, it's providing shade for the Anubias plants that are below. So comparing it to the other side where there's nothing covering them, the ones on the right side have algae spots all over them. And because they just can't take a lot of light, Anubias can't. Bucephalan just seem to be a little bit different. They seem to be able to grow in any light. But the Anubias, they can't handle the, the high light without getting algae all over them or their leaves starting to melt away. And so this has been a cool experiment. The hydrocodals um, uh, really protecting these Anubias, which is neat. And I would think it's almost a little more natural even having the floaters providing some shade. This shot's also cool because you never, this is how if you're uh, snorkeling or scuba diving or something, you get overhead shots. I mean, we don't go and sit on the bank of a, a river or a creek and look at plants directly straight ahead. You look down. And so this is a more natural view, I would say. Um, it's also cool seeing the water shimmer and seeing just how the plants look. Some plants even have a different color from the top angle, uh, like the limnophila all the way back here. And, and whenever the light gets high, they start turning pink and like a pinkish purple. And especially on their undersides of their leaves, they turn like that. So if you ever end up with an open top tank like this, that's rimless, you can get these cool views. One of the only downsides I would say of growing like floating plants, so you can have that open top look, is that you can see right here on in the back, that Ludwigia Natan's Super Red, it's pretty much lost all of its leaf, all of its growth on the bottom level, uh, layers, but it's still growing. And But when you look over the top of the tank, it looks amazing. And so it shows how adaptable some of these plants are but if you are looking mainly from a head, say you're sitting on your, in your living room or in the kitchen or something, and you want to see those plants, well, you're not going to if you have floaters. So just know if you ever grow floating plants in this kind of tank, you're going to probably kill your higher demand plants. But your lower light plants like the Anubias and um, certain plants like that, some of your mosses and all that, they'll love it and you'll get less algae. So I wanna go over all of the hardware and all the things that are running the tank right now. And so I already mentioned them, but I'll just say it again, that the lights are AI Prime HD Freshwaters. And this actually worked out because whenever I went to set this tank up, I got them on clearance because they released new lights, the company did. And so they were like, I think a third of the cost is awesome. And so those are all running on 70% power and I have the reds on 100%. That seemed to work for me. Eventually I'll probably turn them down, but you just use their either their app or you can use the web browser to control the light intensity. And so I have it ramp up in the morning 
it's on for about seven hours full intensity and then it ramps down and then goes into a blue light um, around like 8 p.m. or so. And so that's been perfect for, for me. I like that. The only other, to, really the only hardware I have in the tank is this power head. So it's just a Jebel uh, WaveMaker power head. Really cheap compared to all the expensive DC pumps. So this is a DC pump. Basically I can c control it through its controller that it has and it's silent. So I recommend DC pumps. JBAL is awesome. They might be a Chinese or Japanese knockoff, but they work just as well as all the expensive American company brand things. So I'm gonna look, uh, do a look at the sump now. So this is the sump. And again, the sump is about 40 gallons and it's all glass, it's trimless too, cause why not? And pretty much you can see what happens here is, this is the return line that comes down from the overflow box and it has a gate valve on it. Basically this gate valve along with a silencer that is on the return piping in the overflow box, those two together make it so you can essentially make this silent. And uh, I don't know if you could notice, but if you were here, you would notice the tank makes pretty much no noise. And the only time it makes any noise is once the, the grates on the overflow box get full of plants, then it'll start trickling. Because there's a second line, this line here is the, it's like a emergency uh, overflow in the overflow box. And so if this one isn't able to pull the water that's in the box fast enough, it'll go into this one and you start hearing the trickling, which it's kind of annoying whenever that's happening, but it's also helpful because it goes, oh, I need to clean out my overflow box or I need to clean out the, the piping because sometimes stuff gets stuck in the piping. I would recommend do not put pipe cleaners down the overflow pipes because I dropped one last night whenever I was cleaning this tank into the box and it was a pain in the butt to get out. Although it really wasn't as bad as it could have been if this was a normal plumb tank because you see here, this is a union, which saltwater guys will know this, but the union it allows for an easy disconnect uh, of the piping. So we're able to pull this off. And then in here, if you're able to see, these are just all screwed on. So they're not glued. And so that's one of the things about this tank that makes it almost plug and play is they send you the tank and the stand and the sump and all that. And other than putting the stand together, really all you have to do is you just stick these pipes through the bulkheads that they've already done uh, through, and then you screw this part uh, just right on to the bulkhead. And there, there's videos out there that explain how to set these up. But what we were able to do last night is just pull, just undo this right here and pull all of this off and the pipe cleaner fell right out. So although that was stupid, you live and learn, and it was actually a pretty easy fix compared to if these had been glued, we would have been screwed. And so the screw uh, method is good that there's really nowhere else I can put any more unions because it's so tight in here, but that's okay. We didn't even need it. So along with that, I have um, my return pump, which I don't know if you can see it, but it's back in here. But it's a Ecotech Vectra M2 pump. I don't. I think it may have been their most, one of their most powerful pumps, at least for the Vectras. And it was one of the recommended pumps by Red Sea for this tank. And even with it on full blast, it it's providing you know decent flow, but for a planted tank, it's kind of low. So that that's why I have that power head uh, in the tank. So in a saltwater tank, normally you would want lower flow going into your sump so there's more reaction time over your filter media but in a planted tank we kind of want more movement through the the filter um, so they can get all that gunk out and so pretty much what happens is the water overflows into here and like i said you can control this it controls the flow basically how open or closed that pipe is and the water comes into this compartment overflows into here which these are removable uh, filter cups, which is nice. You have these with filter floss in them instead of socks. It's much easier to clean. 
and then socks and these last me for like I change them every water change which is I've been doing about once a week on Saturdays I change about 50% I clean out my socks or my filter floss and then it then goes into this compartment this has kind of just been a just throw in stuff compartment I basically just have sponges right now for more um, uh, mechanical filtration but also for more biological filtration so that's a lot of area we have here to grow bacteria which helps filter the tank and then I was actually having trouble with our tap water here the city of Austin puts phosphate in their tap water and I don't know why it doesn't make any sense to me but I don't know I'm not you know they're watching them do it knowing why but I, this is a phosphate removing pad and is how well does it work I'm not too sure but eventually I'm going to move to water changing with reverse osmosis water and then I won't have to worry so much about the phosphate and then in that case I probably won't have as much algae problems because my nitrates tend to be really low phosphate tends to be moderately high and so that's been a pain I, like I said I think that combined with the low flow feeding extra to the fish has been where my algae problem has come from as well as that marsilia just does not um, it doesn't have good flow through it it's more of a just a blocker so anyway it flows into here and then it flows into the back compartment which if you were running the salt water you would probably put a refugium back there or you could also put a, a skimmer but what I decided to do is I just put a Home Depot shop light in there and I'm growing moss it's a cheap shop light, nothing fancy, no expensive refugium light. It's just um, just a cheap light, grow moss. I have mainly Subwassertang in there, which is the German moss, and it grows like crazy. So it's basically like a saltwater refugium with catamorpha, but freshwater. So in there, I also have some filtration. I have a, a like a bio, marine pure bio block in there, which holds a ton of... Uh, uh, bacteria and then I also have an Eheim Jaeger 300 watt pump just laying back in there as well so this has pretty much just been my moss grow out area so this this section stays pretty clean but it's still a good idea to clean out your sump every once in a while so other than that yeah just it'll just then run into the next compartment and so I have to explain this. This is something that a lot of the saltwater guys don't like. This is actually a gravity fed auto top off reservoir. And it looks like a glass box, just boring glass box or a tank. But it actually in the bottom, it has uh, holes that allow it to slowly drip water into your tank to fill it back up as the water evaporates. And so having an open top, you're going to get more evaporation. Having uh, stronger lights, more heat, more evaporation, um, as well as just having all the water moving into the tank, all the uh, reaction to the air, you're going to have more evaporation. So it's good to have auto top off. This is seven and a half gallons. And for me, it's perfect because if I'm doing weekly water changes, it la it's been lasting about a week. And it's, it's usually low by the time I go to water change. And so perfect timing. And I just fill it right back up. So no big deal. Other than that, in my final compartment, which is harder to see, but in my final compartment, I just that's where I inject my CO2 into, as well as I'm running a little air stone in there right now um, for oxygenation at night. So the only thing I didn't mention is in this front compartment, along with the so I have the CO2 going into the back compartment and I have a pH probe here, which is measuring the pH of the water right as it comes from the main tank. So that's what will tell it what the pH is. So it needs to know to turn it on to the back compartment to shoot up into the tank. So that's a sump. It's huge and awesome. So you can do a lot of stuff in there. You could have a whole nother tank in there if you wanted to raising fish, plants, whatever you want to do. It's, it's up to you. It's up to your imagination and needs. And so now I'll look in this section here. This is the, at first I thought, man, they take up so much space in the stand with the sump. But that's okay because this compartment is actually decently sized compared to most uh, tank stands. 
And with the stand being so high, um, it actually gives you a lot more space. So what we actually have in here is a, I have a medicine cabinet, which I've mounted all of my controllers on. And uh, there's holes in the medicine cabinet. And so I just run all of my wiring as much as I can through there. So most of it's hiding back there instead of laying all over the place. And they just come around the back and plug into this power strip. So it's a, it's a 12 slot like power strip, which I'm running everything off of. And I haven't had anything like short circuit on me. So it's all running fine. Um, so I'll just go through everything that I have in here right now. In a plan and tank, what people probably think is most important hardware wise is your CO2 system. This is a five pound CO2 tank and I have it hooked up to this regulator. It's a Titan Controls brand. It was just a cheap one that I found on Facebook Marketplace and I lucked out because regulators are expensive and this one wasn't. So this is the regulator and this is the solenoid. And so the solenoid is what lets me hook it up to my pH controller. And with the pH controller, this is a Milwaukee uh, brand pH controller, probably the most popular. And I just set it to 6.4 pH. The idea is that it, to get to 30 parts per million CO2 in the tank, you will have about a one point pH drop, generally speaking. And so because my tap has been around 7.3 to 7.4, or at least whenever I put it in the tank and it, and it mixes in, it measures about 7.3, 7.4. And so I just decided, why don't I just put it to 6.4? When I did that at the beginning, I realized that um, it shot my pH down really low past uh, 6.4. I actually went to 6, which is getting very acidic. And I didn't know why, and I realized, well, our tap water, although it has a strangely high pH, the KH and GH are really low. And so whenever you have that, your water isn't very balanced. So when you're injecting CO2, it's going to drop your pH of your water really fast. So I thought that would be a difficult fix. It actually wasn't. I, because I do salt water too, I had a leftover bag of crushed coral or aragonite, which raises the KH and the pH of the water. I threw the bag of uh, aragonite into the sump and it raised my cage up by I think like three points on average and then suddenly my pH stopped having ridiculous drops. So uh, not going to go deep into the science but it worked. And so right now uh, like I said I'm running it at 6.4 that allows my I have a drop checker in the tank which turns green whenever it's at the right uh, 30 parts per million. CO2 in the tank and it's been working. Cool thing about running with a pH controller is that it will turn off your CO2 tank whenever you get to the right level. And now it's not necessarily turning off your CO2 when you get to 30 parts per million CO2 in the tank. You're kind of uh, estimating that, like we said, when you have a one point drop, it'll, it'll um, be at the right CO2. That's pretty much what's been happening. So no matter what, when my, tank is running during the daytime and I have the CO2 system going, I'm always at 30 parts per million CO2. So that's perfect. And um, yeah, no, it's great. It does its thing. And the CO2 tank, because I'm running it with a pH controller and it's not running constantly, which a lot of people do is they run it their whole daytime hours. Because of that, um, it's actually been lasting me about two months. And that's two months for 200 gallons, which is quite insane. I thought I was going to have to get like a two 10 gallon tanks and hook them up together to get them to maybe last a month. Not the case. I recommend running a pH controller. Although they seem expensive, you're saving a ton of money by not constantly running your CO2. So even then you can still, I have all this hooked up to a, I have these Casa smart plugs and I pretty much have all of my controllers on smart plugs. Now that may seem silly, but it's an extra, um, safety feature, I guess, of maybe my controller stops working properly. Well, I know my smart plug is either going to turn it off based on when I've timed it to, or I can just turn it off through an app on my phone. And I can be in, I can be in Mexico, uh, sitting on the beach and look at my app and be like, oh, my, um, 
pH controller is acting up. It's turned off. I need to turn it back on. It's pretty awesome. So they're pretty affordable and you can do it all through one app. So that's just Casa. They have these big ones, which actually I don't recommend the big ones. I don't know why they make these because they're bulky. And they also have these little ones, which don't take up much space. I recommend the little ones. Casa smart plugs, they're awesome. So that's the pH uh, controller and CO2 system. Uh, this here is a temperature controller. Not completely necessary. It was more necessary in my saltwater tank where you really don't want shifts of temperature for the corals. But it's still good. I like having consistency. Um, most of my tanks I don't run, uh, freshwater tanks I don't run heat. But in this one, I wanted consistency. So I have it set to 76 degrees and it will allow the tank to get down to uh, 75 or pretty much 74.9. It'll kick on the heater in the sump and take it back up to 70. The other way is you have a cooling option. So there's the heating option, the cooling option, the heating or the cooling option, you can hook up like a fan to it. Basically, you could put it over your sump or over your main tank. But uh, I, I don't think I'm going to need that because we always keep our house around like 74 to 76 in the summer. So I don't really need that. But if that's if you find that that's a problem with your tank, I recommend a temperature controller. You would think that the heater would be fine because it has a way to measure temperature in it. But um, as far as I've heard, the what the heaters use to measure temperature is really wimpy and they break. And so as long as that heater is working um, properly, as long as it's able to turn on and off, um, I'm gonna use it because the temperature controller is really what controls everything. Um, so, so the heater I just keep f like fully on at like whatever, like 100 degrees or something, because that doesn't matter. That just makes sure it's, it will turn on no matter what. This is what controls it, so. Um, I then have, uh, this is my return pump controller. So this is my uh, Ecotec Vortec uh, M2 pump controller. And you can do a lot of things with this. I mean, you can, uh, they have their like ReefLink hub system that you can get where you can look at your uh, stats. Let's say, how, how's my pump been doing in flow over the, you know, the last eight hours? You can go and look at all that stuff and it actually will control their lights and their power heads as well. They have better views, but if you do get that, I've heard, if you just directly link it up to your router, then there is no problems. But I may do that down the road, but it wasn't necessary because I'm able to do everything I need here. So basically I just turned the flow all the way up and there's a, you can turn it off. There's also a feeding option which takes the power down to 10%. And, but yeah, it does what I need. It's pretty cool. And I usually just turn it off whenever I am water changing because I have a um, battery backup here, which is also by Ecotech. I strongly recommend the battery backup or any battery backup if you're running a sump for your filtration. And the reason for that is, let's say my power goes out and there's two things that, that are bad that could happen when your power goes out. Your, um, well, one is your water is going to keep overflowing in, from the main tank. And so, okay, so that can only do so much, right? But another problem is this tank, because the piping is so short in here, and I can't really, uh, I have nowhere to add a check valve, what happens is it starts back siphoning through the return. And as of right now, I, I don't know what to do about that. Um, I, they had really, whenever I bought or got this tank, they had really long lock line outputs and I took those off. And so now they're almost sitting almost right under the surface. So I did that slightly for more oxygenation, but also so that less water would siphon, back siphon whenever the pump turns off. So with your battery backup, Actually, what it does is it doesn't allow your pump to turn off. It'll sense whenever the power turns off and it takes your pump to, I think, about 10%. I think it, with the, if you have the reflink, you can control the percentage, but 10% is fine. That's enough time to get home and um, realize like what had happened. But if it's a power outage, that lasts, what, maximum, let's say two hours, three hours, which rarely happens here, um, then you'll know that you're safe. So. That's the battery backup. They're 
kind of expensive and they, I don't know how long they last, maybe like a few years, but it's totally worth it. So um, unless you're home all the time, I would get a battery backup. And then the last thing really in here is just my controller for my Jebao pump. So you can see, I mean, they make them to look just like the mainstream pumps. And this thing was super cheap on Amazon. And I'm able to do a bunch of things with it. They're made generally for salt water, but um, I just use it for my fresh water. Right now what I'm doing is I'm having it turn on every, uh, at the in the first 15 minutes of every hour, pointed a little more towards the substrate to stir stuff up. Um, I thought about just running it all the time and I may end up doing that. And I've also considered adding a second one to the other side just to keep things stirred up so that I don't um, get excess nutrient buildup. But we'll see. It's off right now because it's not uh, the first 15 minutes of the hour. So I actually have that also plugged into a Casa smart plug so that I can control it a little better. Other than that, I just use this as storage. I have my fertilizers, which right now I'm, uh, I'm on a low dosing plan. And the reason I'm doing that is because, um, well, in attempts to not get algae. And because, of, because compost and soils are packed with nutrients, ideally you wouldn't have to be fertilizing regularly as if you had an inert substrate. And so hopefully that compost is gonna give me maybe years of the important nutrients, at least the micros. And so, but what I'm still doing is um, I'm dosing nitrogen about um, every other week at the beginning of the week, like on Mondays. And then, to be honest, because my phosphates have been so high, I haven't been dosing my phosphorus. I did dose it last week because it had been like two months since I dosed it. But that shouldn't be as big of a deal, at least when you're on tap water and using a substrate that's decomposing. And then uh, the M is the micros, K is potassium. So micros are once a week. Potassium actually is every other day. Um, and this one is just potassium. It doesn't have other stuff loaded into it. It's a micro, I mean, it's a single nutrient that you're dosing. Uh, and then I got my prime for water changes and flourish iron. On this plan, they recommend doing iron um, once a week. And so you do it midweek. And that's because uh, iron is supposedly, it is used up by the plants very quickly or it dissipates out of the water very quickly. And so even though, even though these are chelated, which basically means they're supposed to stay in the water until they're used, um, iron, for whatever reason, will dissolve out of the water really fast or be used up really fast. And so that's what I dose. Other than that, um, yeah, that's my bubble counter, which th the water of my bubble counter siphons into the tank over and over and over. So it's just sitting here. You can, all, you can keep this full and it'll just show you how much bubbles are going, but pretty much in my system, I just keep my I just keep my main tank fully open in my solenoid. I just give it like it's probably around like four to five bubbles a second. It's pretty fast, and I just run that into a little diffuser. You would think you would need a giant diffuser or multiple diffusers for such a big tank, but you really don't. Um, it just you just don't. And then I just have my I have my uh, stuff for water changes. These are my scissors for pruning got a net, I have like a sand sifter um, and various things like that. I keep my, um, all of my test uh, chemicals in here and that's pretty much it. So, uh, and then my air pump, just a little air pump for running air at night. That is one thing in the big tank. Um, just make sure you're getting enough oxygenation in your tank. So the plants are providing a lot of oxygen but still, it's a lot of water to provide oxygen for. And if you think about it, if we're not getting super good flow, getting oxygen at the lower level of this tank is gonna be a little bit harder. And so it's, it would be good if you, know, you added an air pump running into the, the return, especially at night. Now I'm trying a cool thing with running the moss in the sump. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm running them when, so I have the sump lights on whenever the main tank lights are off. It's kind of an experiment to see um, what'll happen, but since plants produce more oxygen when the lights are on, I'm hoping that 
there will never be too much uh, like CO2 versus oxygen uh, in the tank, which would be hard on your fish and your invertebrates. Plants don't care. But um, I think it's a theory I don't know quite yet, but I think I may be using less CO2 if the moss in the sump is absorbing that CO2 that the plants are releasing. And there's kind of this, just this uh, constant back and forth um, day and night of the main tank plants in the sump plants that um, one is putting out CO2 while the other is putting out oxygen and, and then vice versa. Um, so because of that, I'm hoping that that's what is uh, keeping my CO2 levels a little more consistent. So uh, we'll see. I don't know. But because my CO2 stays so consistent, I have a feeling that that's, that may be a little bit of the case. So most people think that when you have a sump that you're going to lose a lot of CO2 in the water because of the oxygenation. But like I said, my CO2 stays consistent. My tank uh, turns on, you know, maybe like if I'm paying attention, it's probably like four or five times a day for like five minutes. Other than when I turn it on in the morning, it comes on in about an hour before the lights come on. And it's on for about 30 minutes pumping CO2 into the tank. And that's it. Um, so I think I get a good system going here. And if you need any help or have questions about that, want more specifics, uh, just let me know. So the, the last thing I want to just go over is just the fish that I have in here and kind of what I'm trying to accomplish here. So when I started this tank, I just wanted like a dream tank and I wanted something that I could do whatever the heck I wanted to and have it for a very long period of time. And so at first I was getting kind of like stressed out. I wanted it to be perfect. And when I started getting algae, I was freaking out. Oh, I've done something wrong. Um, and you know, we had, we had a little, a few fish die at the beginning. What have I done wrong? But now I'm, I'm just seeing this as a giant, um, fun experimental tank where I can try things out. So someday eventually down the road, I'm gonna figure out what this tank needs and what I enjoy about it and what I wanna focus on. Right now it's a little bit of everything. That's why you see highlight plants, low light plants, you know, medium, um, marsilia, you got marsilias, but then you got cryptocorns, you have vertalas and all these things. And so um, I am just trying things out right now and we'll see what works. But I wanted to talk about the fish. And so a lot of times people with, in their planet tanks, if they're focused on plants, like if that's their thing, because you pretty much have to decide, do I want to focus on plants or do I want to focus on fish? You don't have to, but that's what a lot of people do. And so in this tank, I said, well, I want to focus on plants, but I also want some fish, which doesn't really work too well. And so I'm just trying things out. I'm trying to keep the fish population lower, which is not too hard in this tank, while still having fun. So my main guys are, I have these four angelfish, and so they're all still kind of young, that's why they haven't colored up a lot, but they're really fun. These are all tank-raised angelfish. They're supposed to be, uh, they're called Philippine Blues, and so four of them, they all get along pretty well, and they're all very curious, and they like to eat, which you can see anytime I do this, they're they're ready, like they want to eat. I don't have anything right now, <laughs> but I'll, I will feed them. I feed them uh, every one to two days. And they're, they're really cool. I got them from an auction uh, here in town. I have my Siamese algae eaters while well, we can actually see them. <laughs> I have two of those and they are awesome. They're hard to get pictures of because they're always moving, but they're really fun. They have cute personalities and I love to watch them. I have uh, 10 cardinal tetras right now. I rescued some fish. There was a guy, he, it's a long story, but he, he had to break all of his um, aquariums down. You see all the cardinals moving in. He had to break all his aquariums down and in one of them he had a bunch of cardinals. And so I took his cardinals and I took his, um, what else did I take? I took several of his fish. And, um, oh, there's one lone albino remedinos tetra over here. And I'm fixing to get him some new friends, but, but um, pretty much in this tank, I'm wanting to keep it low while still having multiple types of fish in here. And so I got the guppies. I wouldn't normally get guppies, but these were at an auction and I got them for like a dollar. And they've already been pumping out babies. You can see it. I mean, if you ever have a male and a female guppy in the same tank, you're gonna get babies. And so 
mama's always packing and the babies have actually been hiding in my like hydrocodal forest up here, which is kind of funny. I don't know if they're getting, getting eaten, but um, I found some in the sump, which is actually kind of funny. So there's actually babies living in the sump right now. So technically it's acting as a refugium. You can see in the back there, the that's my epistogramma. It's epistogramma, croco, toys, something like that. Um, and they're always in and out, but I actually have a male and female and I believe they have somewhat paired up. They're getting there, but the relationship status is it's complicated. And other than that, I have some cherry barbs. You can see one there, but they're like really good at hiding right now. The little, little tiny cherry barb. I have six of those, but they've all been hiding in the back. And then I have, so um, bristlenose plecos, just regular bristlenose plecos. There's one on the cryptocorn spiralis. So that's cryptocorn spiralis tiger, by the way. And this one seems to really like higher light. It's unnecessary, but it does better. It gets more red and bronze. It's really pretty. But yeah, that's a pleco resting on there. You can actually see up here, I have this crayfish. And we saw it before, but this is a ghost orange ghost something crayfish, which I got from Aquatic Arts. And I've always wanted to keep crayfish. And this one was my first test crayfish. So I got that one, he was doing okay. And so I got also got an electric blue crayfish from someone local. And they're doing good. They're supposed to get like five, six inches, but we'll see. Um, we'll see how big they actually get. But um, some of the tests are, I'm seeing their effect on plant the plant mass because they're supposed to eat plants, which is kind of funny because, um, well, I have a lot of plant mass and in a tank like this, you're always trimming plants. So if he wants to eat some of my plants, I'm okay with that. Um, I've witnessed them eating marsilia as well as hydrocodal. So two plants that grow like weeds. Uh, other than that, I have a bunch of mystery snails. There's, they're always kind of hiding in here. There's a little mystery snail right there. And, um, yeah, there's another one moving in there, but they're cute. You know, they, they do the job on cleaning up gunk, but I'm thinking about getting a lot more because I probably have like 10 snails in here. And honestly, I could probably have like a hundred snails in here and <laughs> hopefully they would help me with some cleanup. But that's, a, that's about it for fish. All the quarries are kind of hiding and it's pretty low stocked right now. Um, I plan to just add maybe more Corydoras types and um, maybe some more Cardinals and Rummy Nose Tetras, but that's about it. I don't need a whole lot. I enjoy the plants um, mostly. And so, so yep, that's mainly it. At the end of this month, our cl local club has an auction. So I'm, I'm probably gonna pull a good amount of plants to take to the auction. And at that point I'm gonna going to decide if I want to move this tank down to like a low tech kind of thing. So go mostly focus on the cryptocorns and such. But what I'm going to do is I'll probably slowly move down the light and see what starts to get affected. Um, probably my stem plants will start to get affected. I had an experiment for about a month of I didn't fertilize because we had the flu. It was terrible. This, uh, but I mean, this tank sustained itself while we had the flu, we just had to top off the auto top off and clean the grates. But in that time, uh, yeah, most of the stem plants weren't happy. They started, uh, they stopped growing for various reasons. We had turned the light a little bit lower and my CO2 tank ran out for a period of time and we weren't fertilizing. So, and we weren't water changing. And so, uh, yeah, they did not like that. And we put them all back to where they originally were at and everything started growing back. But Right now with that, with the algae and um, just the gunk buildup and all of that, um, I'm not completely sure what we're gonna do right now, but we'll, we'll probably end up um, going lower light, but we'll see. But uh, that's the tank. Other than that, if you ever think about getting one of these tanks, just know they're incredibly heavy. And it's not just that they're heavy, like let me get a few big guys to help me with this. It's that because they're rimless and it's so perfectly like fit on the stand that you have nowhere to grip it. And so um, it's just impossible. We got, uh, so what we did is we hired some movers and 
there was these four guys, four big guys, and they couldn't pick the tank up because there's nowhere to grip it. And, you know, me and the guy that I got it from, um, we told them, like, you're not going to be able to pick this up on your own. You need suction cups. So, of course, the guy had suction cups on him, and they were able to use that. But it took pretty much half a day to get the tank here, luckily with no, no scratches or anything. So, But this is an awesome tank. I totally recommend it for anyone wanting to do fresh water. Unless you know what really what you're doing and you have a lot of time to take care of the plants, uh, I would recommend going more like a lower light kind of uh, setup here, just because it's really hard to keep this clean and trimmed. But if you have a lot of time on your hands and you love that kind of stuff, then go for it. This tank looks super awesome, full of plants and especially when you're sitting in the living room looking at it, it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. And, um, you know, people are always like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. And I'm like, don't you see the algae? And they're like, I don't, what? What do, I don't know what that is. So if you sit back and just accept that this is how it is, you, you'll enjoy your tank. So if you have any questions about this tank, of how to set it up or whatever plants, fish I have in it, just, uh, just ask me uh, in the comments. You can also follow my Instagram, which is just at Towns Aquaria. I'm going to put links to uh, everything included in this tank below where I got it. And a lot of these things, at least this hardware wise, you can get from Amazon. And so I love buying things from Amazon. It's easy. We have two day shipping, so we'll do that as well as other things I got from like most of the plants are from Boost Plant. Um, the, the the tank I got from a local guy, but a lot of this stuff you can get from like Bulk Reef Supply um, or Marine Depot. But I'll put um, the links to, to everything in here and if there's something that I missed, just let me know. Uh, thanks for watching my video. Again, you can find me on Instagram and if this video goes well and people like it, I'll keep doing more videos. Now, just enjoy some footage of this tank.